direct the Stanford Racing Team. This is car racing without a driver in sight. It's about building machines that can drive themselves and race on their own. And how successful is that at the moment? I uh, know that DARPA started the DARPA Challenge a few years back, and in the first year, almost nobody completed the race at all. That's correct, and we, <laughs> we participated the second time around, and we completed it and won it. So. I would say it's quite successful so far. Our goal is to change all of society by introducing a new idea, which is cars that can drive people around without them paying attention. And there's a lot of stuff to be done on that. Technically, what you do, you take the, the person out of the loop. So first, you put a motor on the steering wheel and the gas pedal and a couple of sensors on the roof so that the car can actually see something. But the biggest challenge is to put computers inside and program them to be smart. It turns out people make a lot of decisions during driving. It's a very complicated thing. There's a child running on the street, a deer on the next corner, mm -hmm. and people have to react to this. Now you have to write a computer program that just emulates people's behavior. That's very, very challenging. But back in the 80s, people worked a lot on highway driving because it's kind of the easiest. Mm -hmm. Your relative speed to other cars is relatively slow. And then people moved into desert driving, which is harder because the terrain is much more complex. It's really like off-road driving. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of standing and nothing really moves. The, the city is the worst from that perspective because you have like kids running around and you have other cars uh, driving around. And you have to really understand what these other cars are doing, how they interact with you to make a good decision. So it's really the, the pinnacle, the most complex way of driving. And that's why it comes last. The physical world is actually as slow as it used to be 100,000 years ago, so nothing has really changed. The amount of data intake is fairly constant, right. and it's not the number crunching power that makes the car go, go right, it's actually the smartness of the algorithm. So mm -hmm. if you make the brain twice as fast, you'll gain nothing, you really have to make it twice as smart. It's a little bit different for our new car, Junior, which we are basically announcing today to the public. Uh -huh. um, junior has to, uh, we call it surround uh, sensing, which is not just look forward as you as would be required in desert driving, but you have to look to the sides and behind. Yeah. And we have to look about twice as far. So now we have about a data stream about 10 times as dense as before. And that requires about six high-end computers. And uh, a lot of work goes into a combination of writing software and training. Okay, mm -hmm. so when we we first program a car to get basic behaviors right, like understand what, a, what another vehicle is, how to react to it. Mm -hmm. And at some point, in Stanley's case, and the same will happen in Junior's case, we can't do it manually. We can't, we can't program every contingency into the car. We have to really let it experience this contingency itself and then comment it. And the way this works mm -hmm. is we, we train it. We, we sit in the car, manually drive it, and Stanley uses its, its wonderful sensors and watches us do this task mm -hmm. and then tries to infer rules by itself as to how people drive. In the last race, we used this very successfully for a number of things like controlling the speed and the steering of the vehicle, and we're going to do the same this time around with Junior. And so your, your vehicles, Junior and um, what was the other one? Stanley. And Stanley, they basically have learned how to drive by themselves. Is it a similar process to you know the 14, 15, 16-year-old who's getting the learner's permit from the DMV to <laughs> it's, I think on a 10,000 feet level, it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, And it's really funny because I, I train Stanley for speed. So I, I, I sit down and, and it was me. I'm a German driver, so I'm a fairly reckless driver, turns out. And my postdoc, <laughs> Mike, is a very careful driver, and, and he's, a, he's slower, mm -hmm. uh, but, but much better driver in many ways. And I'm pretty sure if we had him train the speed, Stanley would have lost the race because we just had 11 minutes <laughs> advantage over Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> and it's really that the, 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 we can't really write down these are the equations right now for speed. It's really that Stanley kind of took that over from us. I think it's going to be a, a, a wonderful technology to make highways more efficient. And it takes a little bit of a thought experiment. Take a highway at what we call peak capacity when it has the most numbers of cars per lane possible. We drive all about 55 miles per hour. Turns out if you drive slower, the capacity goes down. Okay? And now go into the air and take a picture of that highway. And on that picture, count the number of pixels that are actually occupied, taken by cars, and the ones that are still free. You find that only 8% is actually taken by cars, and 92% of the real estate highway is still completely available. Why is that so? Because we are lousy drivers. <laughs> we need a, a ton of a space around us on the sides, and we need space in front of us in case we react a little bit too late when the guy in front of us is braking, right? right? So if we only had more, so ro robots are great in precision. That's their stronghold, right? So we can make cars drive more precisely, brake earlier, and, and we left less to left and right. Mm -hmm. if, if we only did this and say, pack the highway instead of 8%, 16%, so it's still 84% empty, mm -hmm. we've doubled the capacity of the US highway system. There's no technology that could achieve this without a trillion dollar investment. You can't build new roads, and you have to build them vertically right now. Right. So with the current increase of use of highways, about 3% per year, 
And the fact that since the 60s we haven't constructed new highways. Mm -hmm. We are steering a total disaster. Highways have become more and more unusable and it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. In this country we lose something like 42,000 people every year to traffic accidents. Mm -hmm. It's like 15 times as many as in, 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 in September 11. It's a huge, this is 42,000 funerals. If we could cut that down, say, by 50%, we'd be so much better off by just using safer cars. I think um, bits and pieces are reality today in the following sense. You can already buy a car that parks itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's a very, very limited way of autonomous driving, yet really useful for some people, which mm -hmm. is great. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's other bits and pieces where the car doesn't drive itself, but helps you to become a more effective driver. Mm -hmm. There's a good number of new technologies coming out, or it just came out, like adaptive cruise control, which is a way to keep a fixed distance to the car in front of you, as opposed to fixed speed, which is great That's wonderful and 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 there's lane departure warning systems so if you doze away on the highway you kind of wake you up and say you're just about to be of your lane okay mm -hmm. but the big thing the the, the holy grail of all of this is of course a self-driving car where i just sleep and it wakes me up when i'm in my garage and i think that's <laughs> going to be about 25 to 30 years away and the reason okay. why it's still that far away is we haven't yet achieved the reliability necessary to to really make it happen so we can deal 99.5 percent of driving is is really simple and, and, and even a 12-year-old can do it, I, I bet. And then this is 0.5% that's really, really hard. And we haven't tackled this 0.5% yet. So our reliability ratings right now are in the hundreds of miles, and we have to go in the hundreds of millions of miles, just to give kind of a scope of number. And that's going to happen in the next year. So I think by 2020 or so, we have the technology to drive millions of miles on highways really reliable. But it's going to take a good, a good investment, actually. It really depends on how the US government reacts to it how much they're willing to pick it up and, and, and claim leadership, uh, and there's many, many unknowns. So there's a lot of, of, of legal difficulties, like yeah. apart from permissions and regulations and what are acceptable standards for autonomous driving, how you certify it, a car to be safe and so on. Mm -hmm. There's also the entire legal responsibility question. I mean, these cars will get into accidents and kill people, even though people are not driving at that point in time. So is it going to, can you sue the manufacturer, like happening in the avionics industry? Or can you somehow find a way to keep the driver responsible? These are all things we have to answer. And they might delay the deployment of these vehicles by any number of years. I'm very, very convinced we're going to break through this and make it happen. Maybe the United States is not the first country. Maybe some other country goes first. Maybe China goes first. There's a different legal situation. Uh, maybe the European countries, the northern European countries are more advanced. Who knows? Right. It's going to happen because the current state of driving is plainly unacceptable.